All right. They're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse number 2. But I beseech you that ye may... Wait a minute. I'm in the wrong chapter. Sorry about that. Back up a second here. There we go. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All right, now first of all, I like this phrase here. I just want to point this out that it says that Moses was baptized, that Moses baptized the people. Did you know Moses was a Baptist? Did you, react to, did you know that? All the great men of faith in the Bible was a Baptist. Listen, that's just a spiritual picture of baptism to come. That's why the Pharisees recognized when John the Baptist was baptizing, they recognized it was a sign of the Christ to come. So Moses was a Baptist just as we are. Look at verse number 10 though. 1 Corinthians 10.10 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Right? So here they're complaining about God's provision. It's referencing back to this story. And we're going to look at it. Look at verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples that they are written for our admonition. What he's saying here is back then, they complained about the way God was providing for them. And God destroyed them. And God wants us to recognize this story is in the Bible for us to learn from. Yeah, right? right? We should not murmur. We should not complain. That's and God destroyed the complainers as an example for us. Something for us to learn from. And what I want to preach about this morning is bad attitude Baptists. Yeah. Alright? I want to talk about these, these people that have a murmuring mouth. That have a bad attitude and what the Bible warns about. You know, in Proverbs 18 it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Yeah. With your mouth you have the power to create life, to, to talk speak positive things into people's lives, and you also have the power of death to tear people down and destroy lives, to put negative thoughts in people's minds. And it, it can ruin lives. It can ruin your job. It says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. If you love being that negative person at work, then you're going to eat the fruit of that. Yeah. right? And we all know the guy at work like that. Oh, it's Monday. Here we go again. You're oh, all... I can't wait to get out of here. Is it time yet? Is it time yet? You know, that's not the type of person we ought to be as a Christian. We should not be murmuring about our situation. The fact of the matter is, we have true joy. We are saved from hell. We are saved from the eternal fire and torment. We've been given the gift of everlasting life. We receive that free gift. We have nothing to complain about. In this world, when we go through trials and temptations and difficult times, we should not be popping off at the mouth. We, we should be an example of somebody that has true joy Amen. and that lifts people up. And God warns us here about the people that murmured. And you know, speaking death is really rebellion. And that is rebelling against the, the joy that God wants you to have. The positive things in life. So if you have a rebellious attitude, then you're going to be negative in the mouth. And that's just the evidence of it. That is your fruit is what comes out of your mouth. And here He warns that they're destroyed because of their mouth. Because of what came out of their mouth, ultimately, literally, physically destroyed them. So we should not have this poor spirit. You know, and how do you recognize somebody that's from the old IFB that has that negative spirit? Right? It's like they're sucking on a lemon. Right? That's how you can tell. That's right. Because the words that come out of their mouth are always negative. Well, they don't do it our way. Well, hey, go on down the road. We ain't got time for that. Yeah. We need to be positive. We need to be uplifting. We need to be helping each other as a family. Amen. We don't need to be gossiping. We don't need to be tearing people down with our mouth. We need to work together for the Lord. We have a mission here, and it's to preach the Gospel. Right. right? And we shouldn't have this attitude as the children of Israel did. Right? They came out of Egypt. They're on their way to the Promised Land, what this is referring to. And what are they doing? They're complaining. Yep. Well, the water's not right. The food's not right. They're murmuring unto God. Right. They're complaining about what God has provided them instead of being thankful for the fact that they've come out of Egypt. Amen. You know what I mean? Hey, and if you're not happy here in this church, go back to Egypt Baptist Church, right? <laughs> go back to Burger King Baptist where they're going to tell you whatever you want to hear. They're going to tickle your ears. You can have it your way, but guess what? It's not the right way. Right. It's not the way, the truth, and the life. They're omitting the weightier matters of the law. Right? They're not preaching the Gospel as they ought to. They're deceiving about their end times revelation. Right? There's all these things that are wrong with all these other churches. And we need to remember what we've been delivered from. That's right. And we need to make sure that we're not tearing each other down. Sure. We need to make sure that we're working together to lift each other up. 
We need to recognize that this is a new family that God's brought us together yeah. and that we have things here that we need to be thankful for. Right. And if we're not, we're being a complainer. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not just complaining to each other or to the preacher. We're complaining to God. That's right. Can you imagine just saying, God, I'm not happy with what You've given me. <laughs> I mean, if we would only recognize the power of our words and yeah. what we're actually saying when we tear other church members down, I think it might we would prevent ourselves from doing such a thing. God does not approve when we have a bad attitude. You know, I was once in a great church and there was somebody that was murmuring. They were complaining. Why are we always talking about soul winning? Why are we always talking about going out and preaching the Gospel? Can't we talk about something else? Hey, that person was weak in the Spirit. They're falling out. Why? Because their heart was not right with God. They were not focused on the things of God. And we shouldn't have that same attitude. They had a bad attitude and it affected them. You know, and most other churches have problems with infighting. With, with forming cliques and going against each other. And this is something we need to be careful of. We need to be conscious of. We need to prevent it around here. If you find yourself saying, well, you know, I don't really talk to that person. I'm just not that fond of that person. You need to make an effort to go out of your way to pray for that person, to talk to that person. I heard it said once, you, there's somebody, I don't know why, but they're always bothering me. Then you pray for that person every day of the week. Amen. And you make a point of demonstrating some love from talking to them. Because it's in the flesh that the devil's going to get us to separate ourselves instead of growing closer together. Right. And we don't need to have this mentality of I'm better or they're not up to my standard or I live to this standard and they're over here or they're down here. Listen, we are all at different standards in life. We are all at different points in our spiritual growth. And the only way you can help somebody else to grow is just say, gee, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Right. Not, oh, well, you're doing it that way? Well, we don't do it that way in my house. That's a bad attitude. That's a murmuring mouth. Yeah. And we need, to, we need to fix these problems to make sure they don't happen in the church. We don't want gossip. Listen, in James 3 says, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. We should not have bitter envying and strife. We should not be tearing each other down. We need to work together to do the Lord's work. We've got a mission here. We've got a purpose here as a church. And it's only going to happen if we all get on board. It's only going to happen if we all watch our mouth. There are times when things come up and we th think something negative about a brother or sister. You just need to shut your mouth. Just shut your mouth and say, Lord, help me. You need to stop it at, at the moment that it begins to happen. And like I said, if you, if you want to go back to Egypt, go back to Egypt. Right? Egypt Baptist is down the road. Right. Burger King Baptist is around the corner. They'll, they'll take you as you are. I had somebody call me, is, this a, is your church a come as you are church? What, no, what does that mean? You know, Because all the other churches come as you are and lead the same way. We don't want you to grow. We're not going to preach the Bible. All they want is your money. And we don't want your money here. Yeah. I want you to grow spiritually. Amen. If you don't grow spiritually, then I have failed. Right. And to do that, we have to talk about the hard things. We have to preach against the hard things. Amen. You say, why are we always talking about the difficult things? Why do we have hard preaching? Why do we talk about false prophets? You know that throughout the entire Bible, from the very beginning, we're warned about false prophets and, the, and what they cause other people. We see it all the way through the Bible. Even in Jesus' time, even in Paul's time, they're warning against certain prophets. This is our job. Yeah. We're going to stand up Amen. against them. This is our job. Why are you always talking about the sodomites? Why are you always talking about the perverts of the world that want to get the children? Hey, they're not allowed in here for a reason. That's right. That's Had a guy right. call it... Well, you we can't. No, this is a family church. Perverts are not allowed. Amen. They're not allowed in the church. That's not right. Amen. Go read your Bible. Why are you always talking about drunkenness? Can't you just lay off the drunkenness a little bit? I mean, what's wrong with taking a couple pills? What's wrong with smoking a little bit of a joint? Don't you know when you lose your sobriety that the devil can just influence you in any way he wants? Right. Did you guys hear about this recently where this girl went to church and clawed her eyes out because she was high on meth? You guys heard about crazy how does that happen she said that she felt she got closer to god when she smoked meth and what happened she goes to a fake church and claws her eyeballs out because she gave up her sobriety she was willing to say well i want to have a little bit of fun for a while and it cost her her eyesight hey she's alive maybe she's savable i don't know her i don't know anything about her other than she destroyed her life because she let this negativity this leaven into her life 
And we as Christians, we need to stand fast on the principles of God. We're going to fight the fights that need to be fought. We're going to preach against drunkenness. We're going to preach against fornication. I don't want the children in here growing up thinking it's okay to shack up, to get married, to discard your spouse, go get another. That's what the world wants to teach you. And they're full of disease. They're full of problems. The ripple waves of sleeping around last for years and years and years. And I don't want to see it happen to the next generation. The only way we can prevent it is to teach the truth on this matter. And that's why we talk about the Trinity as well. This is a fight worth fighting. We're going to fight this fight. God has taught us that salvation is in the Son of God. If you don't believe on the Son of God, you are not saved. It's clear through the Scriptures. The Bible is clear on these doctrines, but the world wants to attack. If somebody comes in here talking about Calvinism, we're going to run them out. If they come in with whatever false doctrine, we need to stand up against it. And if you don't like it, go to Burger King Baptist. Alright? And look, we need to treat each other with love. We need to lift each other up. We need to speak life into one another. We need to provoke each other unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Right? We need to come together. We need to talk about the Bible. It's good to have these discussions. To figure out what you believe and then stand on it. Not being tossed to and fro. And I don't want to see a bad attitude in this church. And there are people with bad attitudes that are against our church. And if you're letting the devil use your lips to whisper poison, you need to stop. You need to figure out how to control your mouth. You need to figure out when to shut your mouth. And you need to figure out how to lift up your brother and sister. You need to figure out how to speak life into them. And you need to go out of your way to help each other. That's their Christian duty. That's your Christian duty to help encourage each other. Turn to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. And look, we're not going to do the, the, the ear tickling that the other churches do. We're not going to have the music of the world in here. You know, where they say, make us a captain, we're going back to Egypt. Go ahead. Yeah. But don't come in here tearing people down. I don't want to see cliques in this church. I don't want to see people separating themselves for physical reasons. Because, well, we like it that way, they do it that way. Well, I'm more conservative, they're more liberal. Hey, you guys need to come together, you need to help each other. Yeah. There are things we can all learn from each other. Yeah. Yeah. From every one of us. From the, from the little of us to the big, I mean, we can all learn from each other. We can all encourage each other. And this is our job and our responsibility as a born-again believer. In James 3, he says, Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a little fire kindleth. Right? It only takes a little fire to burn a whole building down. Right? Your tongue is the smallest part of your body, one of the smallest, and there's so much damage it can do. Just shooting off arrows, popping at the mouth, hurting people. Yeah. And that's how you just, you want to destroy a marriage? Just let your tongue go. Yeah. Right? And why does it happen? Because of covetousness. Because right. you're not content with what God's given you. You murmur against God, and next thing you know, you're yelling at your wife. Right? Yeah. Or, your, or your wife is backbiting against her husband. These are things we have to prevent. And the problem isn't with the tongue. It's in the heart. That's right. Look, he says, "...in the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity." So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. You understand your tongue can destroy your flesh? That's what happened to the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. They were complaining about eating eating angel food. And God said, okay, (laughs) alright, i got a solution for you. Look, He says, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. This is talking to a believer saying your tongue is set on fire of hell. Your tongue is being used of the devil so the devil can destroy things. Listen, and the reason I'm preaching about bad attitude Baptists this morning is so that we all take another look at what we say. We all take another consideration about who we hang out with. Who we gossip about. We need to come together and we need to thank God for the people in this church whether we like them or not. Right? Hey, you can't choose your in-laws, right? But thank God for some of the people in this church. Thank God for the diversity in this church. Thank God for the... I mean, just... You know, every man in the men's preaching night has a different style, a different topic, a different way of delivering it, but yet every sermon I learn something from. I mean, I'm stealing notes from these guys. These guys are good preachers, and I'm thankful we have men in this church that are willing to stand on the Word of God. But in the same way, we need to take the consideration of what can I learn from my brother? Not... How can I tear him down? Did you see what he did? Did you see what he said? Oh, he didn't know about this verse. Man, leave the guy alone. Pray for him. You know what I'm saying? Lift him up. Build him up. Don't tear him down. 
And that same thing goes with your children, with your wife, with your husband. You have to work together to build things up. That's right. This is God wants us to seriously consider what we do with our tongue. He warns us the devil will use your tongue to destroy lives, maybe even your own life. Yep. And we shouldn't let it happen in our house or in our church. Look at Numbers chapter 11 where you're at. Verse number 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it. And His anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. When you tear others down, it displeases the Lord. When you cause strife, whether it's at home or church or at work, God is not happy. When you cause discord among brethren, God says that's an abomination. He hates it. He hates it when we as Christians let the devil get a hold of our tongue and we go to work and we pop off at the mouth. And we talk about that other guy that ain't right. You need to be witnessing to that guy. You need to be helping that guy learn and yeah. grow. Even if he considers you an enemy. Right. In the same way in your house. Don't let a little leaven get into your house. It will cause discord. It will cause you to destroy your own house. If you have a bitter heart against your brother or sister, God is not pleased with you. Not satisfied with church? You need to consider what you've come from. Right? Here in this story, they just came out of Egypt. And they're moving on to the promised land. Now we know the story. They don't make it because they stop. They dig in their heels. They say, no. No, I miss Egypt. Oh, we had all these things back in Egypt that I'm fond of. Do you really want to go back to Egypt? Do you really want to go back to the bondage of those other lame, dead churches where everybody's just as sour as can be? They don't care about you as a person. They don't care about your spiritual growth. Our church needs to be different. Yeah. Our church is different. Amen. Look at verse number 4 here. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. Look at those three words. Fell a-lusting. Don't catch yourself in this situation. They fell because they're lusting. Because they're coveting after something else. They're not content with what they have. Oh, well, we want something better. We want something different. Be thankful for where you're at. Be thankful for what you have. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Yeah. Right? right? Name the children in the church. Brother Luke. Brother Isaiah. I mean, we got Kendall. We got all these kids in these church. I'm thankful for them. Sister Ava. Brother Landon. Count your blessings in the church. That's right. Be thankful for what we have. Amen. I'm thankful for what God's doing here. But you know what? We need to be careful with our mouth. Look what happened. Verse 4. Start over. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all. Look what he says. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Manna? You understand that manna was a miracle? It's angel food that sustained the soul? I mean, if we all had a chance to eat manna, wouldn't you take it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to try manna. Wow, I mean, this was a miracle of God. And they're saying, oh, we've got this stinking manna. What a bad attitude, right? Yeah. Let's not be like these people. Right. They fell because of their sour attitude. Angel food's not good enough for us, right? And you know what? It reminds me of like, like this Goldilocks Christian, right? Oh, it's, oh, it's too soft preaching over here. Oh, it's too hard over here. Oh, this one's just right. They don't preach against my sin. And, you know, they, they tell me how great I look in my suit. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, let's not be a Goldilocks Christian. Yeah. Right? That oh, church was too liberal. Well, this church is too legalistic. Maybe I can find something in the middle of the road, right? Well, that church was too dead, right? And this one over here, we're too alive. Hey, go back to lukewarm Baptist church then. Yeah. Right? If you're not happy with being on fire for God. Amen. In James 3, he says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Remember, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. Are you letting the devil use your tongue for death? To destroy people? Is the devil using your mouth? Shut your mouth. Yeah. Look at verse number 10 here. Numbers 11, verse 10. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families. Every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. 
Moses also was displeased. You understand, by, by them complaining in their family, God was upset with them, and then it hurts Moses. Ultimately, if you continue reading this, Moses takes it to God like, God, this is too much. Why are you putting me in charge of these people? All they're doing is tearing me down with their mouth. Yeah. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10. He says that people weep throughout their families. You know, there was a time where I was complaining about my job. And I was talking to my wife about this situation. I can't believe they did this. And then they made me do that. And you're not going to believe. And she finally said, she had, thank God she was in the Spirit. Because I wasn't. And she said, you know, you're really, you're really dragging me down. You're making me feel worried for you. That they're, they're just slave drivers to you. And they're miserable to you. And I'm like, whoa, what am I saying? Because the things I was complaining about weren't really that bad. Honestly, in retrospect, I don't even know what it was. But I'll never forget the day when my wife asked me to stop complaining. I thought, you know what? We all need to be careful with our tongue. Because it affects other people. And I thank God my wife was in the right spirit at the time. And you know what? It'll probably be my day one day to be in that right spirit and say, hey baby, do you mind uh, not complaining about that? Do you mind showing a little joy and being thankful for what we have? God's given us so many blessings. Listen, it's our, it's our job as a family to lift each other up in your own home. But here in God's home, how much more? Amen. Hey, how was your week? Oh, me. Oh, my. Right? Whoa! <laughs> you know? Is it better than it could be? Yeah. That's why people ask, hey, how you doing? I'm like, well, it, it could be better. It could be worse. So I'll take what I've got. Amen. Right? <laughs> Thank the Lord for what you have. Sure. In Exodus 16, it says, The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. As they're going through all this, as they leave the promised land, they begin murmuring against the leaders. Well, why are they doing it that way? Why are they doing it this way? Well, how come when Brother Joe hands out a bulletin, he does it this way? How come he doesn't always... Hey, hey, hey. Let the leaders do what the leaders are going to do. Amen. Thank God for the leaders that we have. That's right. He goes on, he says, And the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against Him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. When you complain about the authority in your life, you're complaining about God. Yeah. Listen up, wife. When you complain about your husband, you're complaining about God. Uh -oh. Listen up, children. When you complain about the way mom and dad does things, you're complaining against what God has given you. And I promise you it could always be worse. You need to be thankful for what you've been given. Right. Men, when you're at work, and you're my boss, and my job, this. Hey, look, we're all going to be guilty of it at some point. But there comes a point, you know, help, zip your lip, shut your mouth, recognize the error of your way, and correct it. Don't be murmuring against what God has given you. And complain about the authority God set over you. You're murmuring against God Himself. In the same way, if you complain about a church member, you might as well just complain about God. God, why would you put this person in my church? I don't like him sitting across from my row. You need to take heed where you're at. You need to focus on what's really going on. Hey, you tell, why don't you just tell God, hey God, you're not good enough for me, Goldilocks. Right? God, what you've given me is insufficient. I deserve more. How dare you say something like that to God? But in essence, that's what you're doing in your heart when you're tearing down your brother and sister instead of lifting them up. In 1 Samuel 15, he says, For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Don't be stubborn. Don't have a hard heart. Don't be rebellious against the authority that God's given you. You're back in 1 Corinthians. Look at verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all did eat the same spiritual meat and did drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. You understand what they were going through was a picture of salvation. You know what I'm saying here? Look, he says there was a spiritual meat. There was a spiritual drink. The spiritual drink was Jesus Christ. In John 4, he says, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give unto me to drink. Thou would have asked Him and He would have given thee living water. Living water coming out of your soul. What they were going through 
They were going through a difficult situation. And yet God was trying to teach them a lesson about salvation. And He's telling them in the Old Testament, who was that rock? Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was there back then. He wanted them to learn something. In Jeremiah 2, He says, For My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken Me, the fountain of living waters. Who is the fountain of living water? Jesus. He says, They've forsaken Me, the living waters. This is the prophet Jeremiah. And he says, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. A lot of times we, we think we have a better way. Well, I'm going to go do a better thing, right? And what do you do? You forsake something that's great and you end up with something that's insufficient. Yeah. And we don't want to do that. They trusted in Christ for spiritual salvation. They murmured and were supposed to learn from what happened to them. Look at verse 5. But with many of them, these are, they're saved, right? Look, with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now turn to 1 Timothy 6. We're going to come back here in just a second. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. He's saying that they were overthrown of their own lust. They gave up the blessing that they had because they were so covetous all they could think about was what they used to have or what they really wanted and they forgot the blessing that was in front of them. How many times do we do that where we're, we have a job or we have a great spouse and we, we're thinking of other things? You think about it. It happens all the time. That's human nature. We need to be aware of this. We need to be warned of it. We need to be cautious and make sure that we're in the right spirit. In Luke 12, he says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Right? Your life isn't the stuff you have. Not at all. Your life is your soul. Your life is getting other people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's true life. That ought to be your main focus. <coughs> Their heart was not content with what God provided, so they started murmuring. And it affected their whole family. Right? God destroyed them because of their bad attitude. Because of the things coming out of their mouth. Yeah. And you think about it. They lost many blessings because they were not happy with where they were in life. They didn't count the joy. You think about it. Hey, hey, Dad, no fun at your job? Well, why don't you quit it and go work something that's twice as hard and pays half as much? That's no fun. Sometimes we, we have this knee-jerk reaction. Well, I'll show them. I'll just... Yeah? You're going to walk away from that blessing that God's given you? Listen, this can happen to any of us. We need to be considerate of where we're at. It can always be worse. And God may have things better for us, but when we start murmuring against the blessings that God's given us, yeah. we let this bitterness come into our heart. It affects everyone around us. Hey mom, you think, you think your kids are too much? Oh, it's just too much running around doing this and taking care of all that. Hey, how about go back to being a miserable cow by yourself, right? Without any kids. With a barren womb. Be thankful for what you have. Right. Be thankful that God has blessed you. Look, you're in 1 Timothy 6. Look at verse number 6. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. Godliness with contentment. What does that mean? Number one, being a Christian, right? But now that you're a Christian, now that you're saved, you ought to live for God and be content with what, what you have. Mm -hmm. Be thankful for what you have. And God says if you're in that position in life, you will have great gain. The gain He's talking about is not the financial success of the world. He's talking about spiritual prosperity. Growing as a Christian. Helping other people grow. Look at the next verse. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Right? You ever seen a, a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it? What are you going to do? Dump it in the ground? What are you going to do with all those riches? Give it to somebody else? Somebody else that doesn't care? That didn't earn it? It doesn't matter. Your soul is what matters the most. The souls that God has put in your authority, in your sphere of influence, that matters more than anything you own. Look at verse 8. In having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Wait a minute. Did they, did they delete... The house? What about the big house? I don't see that in this verse. Do you guys have a big house in your verse? No. Food and raiment, right? Food and clothing. He says that's enough. That's what Jesus had, right? He had clothes. He had food. 
Yeah, but Jesus, surely he had, no, he didn't have a mansion. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a bunch of animals. Right? He didn't have all these blessings that we look at and say, well, I'm not going to be happy till I get that. And if that's your focus, you will never be happy. You need to say, hey, look, I got something on my back. I got something in my belly. Praise the Lord. Anything else I don't deserve, and whether I like it or not, I'm going to take it as a blessing. And you know, you, you, we've all seen the kid that gets something from grandma they didn't like, or something from an uncle or a cousin. Like, what? Oh, re ooh, really? No, you shouldn't have. You know? <laughs> Let's not be like that with God's blessings. Amen. God says, here, I got something for you. Um, do you have another caller? Just take what He's given you, and maybe one day you understand how He knew it meant it for you. Don't be like a spoiled, rotten child. You know, somebody that rejects the blessings. Look at verse number 9. But they that will be rich fall in temptation and a snare. Look, not will be rich here doesn't mean that, that happened to be successful. Okay? Or that worked and they become successful. The will here is their desire. Those that desire for worldly success is what he's saying. If your number one goal is to increase your bank account, that's what it means here when it says those that will be rich. Your only will, your only desire is to have a bigger bank account. He says you fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. You want to hurt your children? Have a desire for money more than children. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. You know how many rich people are just totally unsatisfied, unhappy with life, they feel like they're drowning because they're so miserable. We drove by the liquor store over here and there's people sitting out front waiting for it to open up. Oh, I woke up sober. This is miserable. Oh, when's the liquor store going to open up? You don't want that life. You don't even want to walk down that road. God has something so much better for you. Don't reject His gift. Don't murmur against the blessings He has. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You want to have a sorry life? Then love money above everything else. Just have that desire to get more and more and more. And if your attitude's the other and you say, well, you know what, I have more. Does that make up? No. If you have plenty, then God's blessed you. Use what He's given you wisely. Thank Him for the blessing. Don't curse your blessing. Don't reject your blessing. Go back to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse number 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, that they are written for our admonition. It's to build us up. It's to protect us. That was an example for us. It, it says, Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Right? If you hear what I'm saying today and you're like, I agree, but that's not me. Take heed. Yeah. Listen. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't really gossip. Take heed. Because we're all probably guilty of saying things about others that are gossip, but we don't count ourselves as a gossip. Right? Take heed. If we start lying, because we all, we all lie. But I think, so, well, no, 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 I just, I just exaggerate. They lie. No, take heed. This is for you. This is for us to move forward, to grow on. I don't complain about church or the preaching, the people at church. Take heed. You could, be, you could fall into this trap. Why is he talking about drunkenness again? Take heed. Take a stand on these things. Stand up for the Word of God. It happens to all of us. We're all guilty. Our mouth is a dangerous weapon. Do not let the devil have control of your mouth. Learn from the mistakes of others, truly. Learn from how other people mess up. And when you catch yourself falling, slipping into that bitterness and, and, and murmuring, just put a stop to it. Be willing to just shut your mouth mid-sentence and then say, forgive me. What I'm saying is wrong. It's not right. I shouldn't say that. Forgive me. Ask for forgiveness. Admit your fault. Pray the Lord will help you change your attitude immediately. His Spirit has that power. Right? When we fall into this temptation, we fall, we start going down that road. You can stop it immediately 
Or you can just harden your heart and say, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm justified in what I'm saying. I could still... No. Man, we got to stop it. we got to stop it. You're going to do so much damage. Look at verse 13 in this chapter. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above the ear able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. If you change your words, you will change your life. Yeah. If you're willing to recognize when you're in the midst of temptation and say, I'm going to stop. I'm going to change it. I'm going to put a whoa, put the brakes on immediately. You can change your life. You have to get control of your tongue. And it starts moment by moment. And rather than when you recognize you're in temptation, say, well, it's all under grace, right? I'm just going to keep going. Well, I feel justified in what I'm saying. I'm good and pissed off. No, stop what you're doing. Recognize that your mouth is tearing other people down and put a stop to it. God will bless you if you, if you stop murmuring against your blessings. Look at verse 15. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. And I love this verse and application of everything we're talking about here today because I truly do feel like I'm speaking to wise men. I feel that the men in this church are wise. We've got some men that are strong in the Lord and strong in the Word, but judge what I say. Judge what the Bible is telling us here. Be cautious of your tongue. Yeah. Don't lie. Don't exaggerate. Don't gossip. Don't murmur. Don't curse your blessing. Judge what's being said here. I'm preaching to the wise right now. Take what I'm saying. Judge within yourself when you begin to go down that path. Turn to Proverbs 15. Proverbs chapter 15. In James 3 he says, But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. If you gossip and strife and cause divisions, that's devilish. Plain and simple, it's devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. That's the devil's goal is to cause confusion. Yeah. To cause you to stumble. To cause you to wonder. And look, God wants you to understand the truth. You know. So how do you repair your broken mouth? Right? You say, hey, that's me. right? Hey, that's all of us. Let's be real. So how do you repair it? How do you fix it? It starts in here being willing to admit it. Right? But you got to stop speaking death. Right. Even if, you know, a lot of times people just have a habit of saying, you know, how are you doing it? Oh, I don't know. You know, no, man. Find something positive. Right? Right? One of the best things I've ever heard. Man, if it got any better, I wouldn't be able to stand it. <laughs> really? Yeah. What are you doing? What do you have that I don't have? You know? Hey, and if it ain't true, make it true. Right, right. Thank God for what you have. Amen. You don't deserve anything that you've got. Right. If it got any better, I don't know what I'd do. Speak life into your marriage. Speak life into your church. Speak life into your job. Speak life into your friends. Don't be that guy that's always complaining. You're tearing people down. Don't be that, that, that lady that's gossiping about other people in the church because they're different than you. Well, you know, they, they let their kids... Well, hey, not your problem. Let them do it their way. Get your nose out of that and talk to them about the Bible. Uplift them. Pray for them. Learn to help each other. You're in Proverbs 15. Proverbs chapter 15. I believe that there's several good answers here in Proverbs 15. Verse number 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. When somebody comes at you with some gossip about somebody else, hey, I don't want to hear that. Hey, I whoa, hey, I don't I don't want to talk about them. There's no need for that. Can't we build them up, right? Because those are the grievous words. You, you let's not cause anger amongst each other. Look at verse two. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. Wouldn't you like that to be said of your tongue? Yeah. Instead of the tongue of the foolish is used by the devil to destroy his own house. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. And you guys have probably know, known somebody like that. Man, everything they say is just total foolishness. I've met people like this in the world where it's like they want to repeat every line they've heard in a movie and, and somehow think it's like stream of consciousness from Hollywood is intelligent. It's foolishness. It's pouring out foolishness. 
You know, I was working on a job this week and I hear this family and they're interacting with each other and the mom is saying this stuff that's basically tearing the kids down. I mean, it was all in good fun. It was a joke. But speaking evil words as if they are evil. And I'm thinking one day they will be evil. And you're going to say, how did they get this way? Because you joked about them being evil. You joked about them doing these things. And now they've just taken it. Oh yeah, it's funny. It's funny. It's funny. Well, then here you are. Now your kid's grown up and they're in fornication. They've got a disease. They've got a kid they don't want. They've got a drug habit they can't stand. Don't speak evil into people's lives. Look at verse 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. The fools of this world, they just want more and more and more of that same negative stuff. And we as Christians, we ought to be different. Instead of speaking death into somebody's future, let's preach the Gospel to them. Let's uplift them. Let's let them know that we love them as we ought to. We're supposed to love the brethren. Look at verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Hey, even if you're in a famine and your heart, hey, you know what? I'm thankful for what I have. Cool. Porridge again. Praise the Lord. We got something to eat, right? If you're of a merry heart, you have a continual feast. A guy, you know the guy like the, the lady like this, positive all the time. There's nothing you can say to drag him down. And that's the way we ought to be. And we ought to, and it's gonna, when it's in our heart, when we have that energy and that, that spirit, it's going to come pouring out of our lips. We're going to be lifting people up. We're going to be saying hi to people and thanking people and just having that positive spirit as we ought to have. Look at verse 23. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. How good it is. That ought to be our goal is to be that person that has that right word, that word of encouragement at the right time. When somebody, hey, man, you know, I'm glad you said that. You just don't know what I'm going through right now. In your attitude, your words of encouragement have just made a change in my life. Today, right now. Our mouth, our church, our life, our future is in our mouth. It's in our words. And it's up to us to change it. Look at verse 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Everybody loves encouraging words from an encouraging person. Well, don't you want to be that person instead of the other one? Instead of the fool just pouring out foolishness? It's up to us to change it. Look at verse 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Oh, life is terrible. Right, you remember that cartoon character Eeyore? Oh, me. Oh, right. Or what was the Charlie Brown? Was it Linus that always had the cloud over him? Right? Don't be that guy. Be thankful for what you have. Be, be thankful that God saved your soul because you don't deserve it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm too poor. I'm too bored. I'm too sick. I need more. Stop murmuring against God. Because that's what you're doing. You're complaining with what He's given you. Stop murmuring against the Lord. And look, there's so much wisdom in Proverbs. There are so many verses on this topic I could have used out of Proverbs. If you don't read Proverbs every day, I want to encourage you to try it. Seriously, there's so much wisdom in the book of Proverbs. There's 31 Proverbs. Most months have 31 days. Read it. Learn from it. Apply it to your life. Let it stick with you. It will change the words that come out of your mouth. There's death and life in the tongue. It's your choice which one you're going to use. You're in Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. All right, it's time to grow up. It's time not to be tossed to and fro with the words of other people. Look at verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. When you grow up, you're going to start speaking love. If you're not speaking love, you're acting like a baby. You're acting like a child. Ephesians 4.16 From whom the whole body fitly joined together, that's the church, 
the whole body, we're all come together, we're all different members, we're all unique. He says, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now this is kind of a deep verse, but the simplicity of it is, I am a human body. My hand, my arm, my feet, they're all nourished from within inside. Right? He says, edifying of itself in love. You all, as members of this body, when you edify with love, when you build each other up with love, the body will grow. This church will grow. Right? Other people in the church will grow spiritually when you make it a goal to speak love into the church and into each other, our brothers and sisters. Look at verse 29. The opposite of this. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. When somebody hears your topic of a conversation, I say, well, that's a graceful... you know, <laughs> Or is it, oh man, I don't want to hear that. You know, we don't just talk about sports around here. We don't talk about the weather. Thank God that we have some men in here. I speak unto the wise. And we're talking about wise things. We're talking about the words of the Lord. And we shouldn't let corrupt communication come out of our mouth. Look, he's warning the church here. Look at verse 30. If we do, look what he says. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You are, your soul is sealed unto the day that you'll be redeemed. That's a promise that will never be taken from you. Once you're saved, you're always saved. That Holy Spirit of God dwells inside of you. But when you let corrupt communication come out of your mouth, that Holy Spirit says, no, don't go there. No, not again. Don't talk about that again. Can't you leave that person alone? Can't you go speak some love into the body? Why are you hurting yourself? Because that's what you're doing when you give in to being negative. You're hurting your own body. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. He said, hey, you need to do it quickly. You need to get it out. You need to shut your mouth. You need to stop it. You need to ask the Lord for forgiveness. You need to set it straight. Verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Remember the, the parable about the servants? The one that was forgiven of so much and then he went and got his brother? Pray me what thou owest, right? Are you that guy? Well, God's forgiven me of all my sins, but this guy over here, I don't like the way he dresses. Right? Well, I don't like the way... Hey, hey, show some mercy. Show some grace. Forgive each other even when they're wrong because you were wrong. You were dead in your sins and God said, I love you. I want you to be saved. I want you to be sealed until the day of redemption. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Turn the next chapter. But it's up to us to make a difference. It's up to us. We have to watch our words. Look at verse number 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Right? Covetousness is lust and desire. Right? What he's saying is, now that you're saved, I want you to stop talking about I want, I want, I need, I will do. No, 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 no. Let God have control of that. And look, we're almost done here. Look at verse 4. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Right? So once you become a saint, you need to focus on giving thanks. And I know this is really simple. But it's something we don't do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be warned about it. We would rather talk bad about our friend than to give God thanks for giving us a friend. Right? How many of us has ever been lonely in life? I just don't have anybody to hang out with. Hey, now that you have somebody, don't pick them apart. Don't tear them down. This is why the old Baptist movement out there is dying because all they want to do is fight with each other and find reasons to pick each other apart. Let's not do that. We've got to change it. We have to be thankful. Look at verse 19 in this chapter. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Hey, we're speaking to yourselves. That's not talking to yourself. That's talking to your brother. Right? How many of, in, of you in here said Psalm 23 to your brother or sister? Right? Speaking to each other. 
encouraging each other, talking about the Bible. Verse 19, I'm sorry, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 6, the last place we'll go. Ephesians chapter 6. So he's telling us, how do we fix our tongue? How do we stop from being bitter? How do we stop the murmuring when we recognize that we're in the midst of temptation? We give thanks. Right? When you're in the midst of temptation and, and the devil's trying to get a hold of your mind, your mouth, and get you to go in the wrong direction, you need to stop and pray for somebody else. You need to give thanks for what God has given you. God, thank you for the great wife that I have. Thank you for the fact that I have children. Lord, thank you for the church that I have where I can go to and actually enjoy the company of the men there yeah. instead of going to a church where I feel like I'm an outcast because I believe what the Bible says about the coming of the Lord. Right. Yeah, yeah. Think about it. We're so blessed to have each other. Yeah. Look at Ephesians 6.18. Praying always, he starts out. Hey, praying for each other always. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Perseverance and supplication for the saints. That's each other. We need to pre persevere. It's difficult. Stay with it. Well, he's a hard guy to get along with. Be long-suffering. Be diligent about it. Look, supplication. Asking the Lord to provide for other people, not just yourself. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the Gospel. Right? So first he's saying pray for each other. Now he's talking about teaching each other. But you notice he made a transition here. I'm praying for other people that they'll have the things they need. Why? So that I can be a better soul winner. You want to be a better soul winner? Start praying for the people in the church. You'll be filled with the Spirit. God will use you. Look at verse 20. Last verse. For which I am ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. God wants us to be bold ambassadors for the truth, for the Word of God, for the fact that Jesus is God. He's our Savior. And it's the only way to heaven. It's the only way to avoid death and hell, the second death, eternal fire and torment. And He wants us to be bold about it. But if we get so distracted that we're tearing each other down, then we miss the mark. We've totally failed as a Christian. And I don't want to see that in our church. I want to, you know, we should speak the gospel boldly by building each other up. It starts by building each other up. Having a heart of being willing to correct yourself when, when you start murmuring, when you see this bitterness coming into your mind. It's up to us to stop complaining and to start edifying. It's up to you. This church is only going to grow spiritually if all of us as individuals say, I'm going to do better with my mouth. I'm going to be thankful for what God has given me. I'm not going back to Egypt. No. I refuse to go back to Egypt. I'm going to the promised land. Amen. Come with me. Let's go. Yeah. Let's be blessed. Let's not curse our blessing. Let's not murmur against what God's given us. Amen. Let's be thankful. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for everything You've given us, Lord. Lord, I do thank You for every person in here, Lord. And I just pray that we would all be able to come together and grow together and lift each other up. Lord, I just pray that You would help us as we all have a desire to know Your Word better, to know You better, and to be bold ambassadors for You. Lord, we trust You for growth. We trust You for provision. And we're thankful for what we have even when we're not sure if it's what we want. Lord, I love You. I thank You for everybody here. And I just pray that You would, you would especially bless our soul winning today. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Amen.